Good morning, American Reformed Church. I want to wish you a warm welcome and just say thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us this morning, even though the way we gather still continues to look different. As always, if there is any way that we can pray for you or support you during this challenging time, please contact our pastors or the church office. Even though we are currently unable to gather together as we are accustomed to our desire to care for you, in the midst of these challenge and uncertaining times remains. So please join me in a word of prayer. God, in the midst of the chaos of the world, we pray that you will calm our hearts and still our racing minds. Help us to find peace in your presence, Lord. As we hear from your word, may you illuminate our hearts and minds. We ask that you would speak to us and that we would hear the words of challenge, comfort, and encouragement that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. As we conclude our series on Fixer Upper, today we are going to look at the church. If we are honest, we have all probably been hurt at one time or another by the church. Perhaps we have been hurt by this church here, or perhaps we are here because we have been hurt elsewhere. Maybe we aren't sure if we fit in or belong, Maybe we have felt judged by what the church says is right or wrong. Maybe we have had bad experiences from other people in, within the church that have left us feeling hurt or confused because we thought church better, churchgoers should behave better than what we have encountered. So I just want to acknowledge the pain that we, have may, that we may have felt from the church. I grieve that the church has at times been a source of hurt instead of a source of fullness. I am aware that finding healing is a process that will take time and there are no easy fixes. But most of all, it is my sincere hope that the brokenness we find in our relationship with the church will not be permanent, that we will not give up on the church, but that we will be willing to work to restore our relationship. Our scripture passage today comes from 1 Corinthians. Now, the church at Corinth, to put it nicely, was a bit of a hot mess. They had factions and disunity with the in-group against the out-group. They had some nasty rumors circling around them. They also had plenty of questions of what it looks like to live out their faith in the middle of their challenging environment. Paul addressed these questions in the letter that we know as 1 Corinthians. Despite all the challenges they faced, he began by opening with thanks, expressing his thanks for them. He then called them to unity and addressed the questions that they had. It is within this context that we find our passage. Hear the words of 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 27. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and through all its parts are many. They form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If, there were, if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lack it, 
so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Thank you, ladies. The context of this passage is in relation to spiritual gifts, but I find within it some principles regarding the life of the church that we can lift from it, especially as we consider fixing up our relationship with the church. I think it's important to focus on how this passage describes what the church is. We need to fix up our image of the church, of what the church is called to be, before we can fix up our relationship with it. In the verses that Kendra read for us, the image that we get is of our unity in Christ. Church is more than a human institution. Church is more than a building where we meet every Sunday. After all, even though right now we are unable to gather physically in this space, church is still happening. Her passage also speaks about the distinctions between Jews and Greeks, slave and free. Within the body of Christ, it is not our distinctions that define us any longer. Rather, it is our baptism by the Holy Spirit into one body. We can all think of some ways that we have been labeled or even ways that we have labeled others, young or old, upper class or lower class, married or single, conservative or liberal. However, in the body of Christ, these labels no longer define us. Instead, what defines us is our status as baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. In the section of verses that Kelsey read for us, we heard about the diversity within the church. While our labels no longer define us, is diversity still present? Absolutely. But instead of causing division, this diversity adds richness to the body. One reason I had my nieces read the scripture for us today is to illustrate the beauty of unity and diversity. Caitlin, Christy, Kelsey, and Kendra are all united in the fact that they are sisters. You can even see some resemblance between the four of them. Yet despite their simple similarities, they are also quite distinct from one another. They each have their own unique personalities. They each have their own set of strengths and gifts. When you put them together, however, their differences do not detract from one another. Rather, their gifts and talents add richness and variety to their family. So it is with the church. In church, we also ought to see a beautiful blend of personalities, backgrounds, giftedness, perspectives, and life experiences. The ways in which we perceive others as different from us ought not to be seen as a threat, but as a gift in contributing to the diversity of the body. Christy read for us verses 21 through 26, which continue the metaphor of the body, but speak to the interdependence of each part. It describes how each part is necessary and is connected to the others. Now, as we think about this metaphor in light of the church, I want to ask you to reflect on this question. How would you describe the church in terms of its character? I want to give you a few moments to reflect on that question. As I considered describing the church in terms of its character, here are some things I came up with. We might define the church in terms of doctrinal standards, theological purity, biblical accuracy, or reformed confessions. We might envision the church based upon the attributes of Jesus, his love, his grace, his compassion. We might describe the church in terms of its mission, service, outreach, providing care to others. None of these are wrong. <clears throat> in fact, all are very important and necessary. So the question is, how can we hold all of these in tension with one another and not let overemphasis on one distort the image of the church as a whole? 
Finally, in the verse that Caitlin read, we have a summary of the passage. Paul reminds us of our identity in the body of Christ and affirms that we are all part of it. Our shared unity, the diversity of our various parts, and our interdependent nature all weave us together into one whole body of Christ. Before we focus on how to fix up our relationship with the church when we are the ones who are hurt, we need to pause for a moment and take some personal responsibility for the times when we are the ones who have hurt others. The first image of our passage examined unity, not just with one another, but with Christ. Church is not fur about furthering our own personal agendas, but about representing Jesus. We ought to show the world who Jesus is through the way we conduct ourselves, both individually as members of the church and corporately as a united body. As Christ's body, we are one with him. So as I think about unity, I want us to reflect on a few questions. Does the way we operate reflect our union with Christ or our commitment to our own agendas? How might others have been hurt when we focused on ourselves? How can we honor Christ in the way we function as a church? The second image of our passage focused on diversity. For the past few years, I have been able to attend the Global Leadership Summit. One theme I have heard again and again is the need to look for diversity within our organizations. Various speakers have challenged those of us in attendance to look around our companies and or decision-making bodies. If everyone looks like us, then we need more diversity. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 describes a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne. Does our church reflect the diversity found within our community? Do we welcome others who are different from us? Do we approach diversity with a sense of openness and curiosity or with guardedness and suspicion? Our diversity comes just not from our ethnic heritage or our socioeconomic status, but around our giftedness as well. As I mentioned with my nieces, they have a diverse set of gifts and strengths, which makes a beautifully balanced whole. We in the church have our own gifts as well. Are we content with the gifts we are given without being jealous of the gifts of others? Can we celebrate the gifts that others have without comparing ourselves to them? Our third image from our passage centered around the interdependent nature of the parts of the body. It contains some principles for guiding our life together. Verse 25 urges us to have equal concern for one another. We don't get to pick and choose who we want to care for, but ought to treat one another with the same sense of compassion and dignity. I encourage you to read Romans 12 for a beautiful description of what it looks like to live in unity and harmony with one another. A few moments ago, I asked you to consider a character description of the church. A few ideas that I suggested were doctrinal correctness, Christ-likeness, and mission. Now, I imagine that we all have a dominant description of what we operate out of most often. There is a time and place for each one. For example, our doctrinal correctness is vitally important. But how do we exercise compassion when communicating these convictions to others? If mission is vitally important to us, how do we ground what we do in love so that we are not just running around doing nice things for people, but communicating the love of Christ and the value of each person in the way that we do work? The final image from our passage reminded us of our identity. In doing so, we need to recognize the dignity of all parts of the body, all members of the church. 
As we reflect on our identity, I want to remind us of a truth from the first chapter of the Bible. Genesis 1.27 tells us that we are made in the image of God. Now, of course, that image has been marred by our fall into sin. However, can we still see the church and ourselves as image bearers who are sinners? Can we hold both in tension, knowing that we often fall short of what we strive for, but our failures do not erase our status as image bearers of God? So I hope what we have discussed thus far will help us recognize where we have hurt others. It is my hope that we will take ownership of where we have fallen short and work to promote wholeness, not further brokenness within the church. Now I want to speak to the aspect of fixing up our relationship with the church. How often have we been hurt because the church does not display unity, embrace diversity, act interdependently, or remember its identity. <clears throat> Maybe we felt like we weren't good enough to belong or got upset when the church set boundaries on what is right and what is not. I will be honest with you. There is a time in my life in a different setting where I did not feel good enough at church. As long as I said what people wanted to hear, I felt as though I was accepted but I didn't feel free to show up as I truly was to speak my opinions or ask honest questions. As long as I put on a mask to show up, spoke and acted in a certain way, I felt I was accepted. That is a tough position to be in, and honestly, it was quite exhausting and draining. <clears throat> but something I took away from that experience was remembering the need for grace. Nothing that I have ever done on my own or will ever do makes me good enough. What makes me worthy is the grace of Jesus. None of us are good enough on our own. We are only saved by God's grace. I knew this for a long time in my head, but didn't understand it in my heart until I began to process that experience. So as we look to fix up our relationship with church, Remember our need for and the beauty of grace. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We find our belonging within the church, our merit for inclusion, not based on anything we have done, but solely on the grace of God. I want to remind us all of the need to extend grace to ourselves and to others. As you think about fixing up a relationship with church, next I want to challenge you to be thankful for it. Now, I acknowledge that if something is annoying you or irritating you, the last thing you probably feel for it is gratitude. Our minds are predisposed to lean toward negativity. But if we continue to dwell on what is making us upset, it'll only add fuel to our fire. But if we can change our narrative of negativity, slowly it will change our outlook. Despite all of the problems that the church at Corinth faced, Paul still expressed thanks for them. In 1 Corinthians 1, 4, Paul wrote, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Even in the midst of feeling hurt, what can you find to be thankful for? Another reason we may feel hurt by the church is we believe the lie that our presence is not needed. Perhaps your frustration causes you to pass judgment on the church and its shortcomings. Maybe you no longer care to participate each week, but show up dutifully and consider your duty fulfilled. Or maybe you have withdrawn completely and the fact that we can only watch church online is perfectly fine with you because you don't have to spend time with those other people that have hurt you. However, I want to remind you that the notion that you are not needed is a lie. Your presence is still vital, 
even if you have been hurt. Maybe this time of online only church is the welcome break that you need so you can continue to further your relationship with God without facing other people who may have hurt you. But I just encourage you, please do not give up. Hebrew 10, Hebrews 10, 25 instructs us, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. For right now, keep watching us online and participate as you are able. But when it is safe for us to worship together again, please come back and join us. Finally, remember your identity in Christ. Jesus is so much bigger than your hurts, bigger than the brokenness that sometimes we all experience within church. Find in him the strength to forgive and remain connected. Colossians 3, 12 to 14 encourages us. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. As much as we have the need to extend grace to ourselves and others, we also need to extend forgiveness to ourselves and others. Even if you don't think you are able to forgive right away, allow Jesus to work through your heart, giving your hurts to him, and finding in him the ability to forgive. So as we close, I want to read an adaptation of the passage that we heard at the beginning. Just as a church, though one, has many people, but all its many people form one church, so it is with Christ. For we were baptized into one spirit so as to form one church, whether young or old, single or married, and we were all given one spirit to share. Even so, the church is not made up of one person, but of many. Now, if a child should say, because I am not an adult, I do not belong to the church, he or she would not for that reason stop being part of the church. And if the worship team should say, because I am not a teacher, I do not belong to the church, it would not for that reason stop being part of the church. If the whole church were teachers, where would the worship through music be? If the whole church were nursery volunteers, where would the sound and projection team be? But in fact, God has placed the gifts in the church, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If the, we all had one gift, where would the diversity be? As it is, there are many gifts, but one church. The person who values Christ-likeness cannot say to the person who values sound doctrine, I don't need you. And the person who values studying the Bible cannot say to the person who values outreach, I do not need you. On the contrary, those aspects of the church that seem to be less important are indispensable. And the character tra traits we think are less honorable, we treat with special importance. And the gifts that operate behind the scenes are treated with special appreciation, while our no more noticeable gifts need no extra observation. But God has put the church together, giving greater honor to the people that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the church, but that its people should have equal concern for each other. If one person suffers, everyone suffers with him or her one person is honored, everyone rejoices with him or her. Now we are the church of Christ, and each one of us is a member of it. Let's pray. God, 
Thank you for the comfort you give us in the midst of uncertainty and brokenness. As it relates to the church, help us to heal our hurts, Lord. Give us the courage to fix up the brokenness we feel and help trust that you are with us and will guide us. Help us to restore our relationship with the church. Help us to be a place of welcome for others. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we go, receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine toward you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.